Hello and welcome to this small presentation about the BTEC Level 3 Computing course. My name is Miss Fiona Kiss. I'm the Head of Faculty and I'm in charge of Business Computer Science IT and Economics, but I teach mostly computer science. Within this video, I'm going to just discuss an overview of the course, details about each unit that you will be taking, the entry requirements, a discussion about the bridging work that I've set, and a small computational thinking task just to get your brains working. OK, so a quick overview of the course. I will go into more detail of the units as we go through. It is the Pearson BTEC Level 3 National Extended Certificate in Computing. It is the equivalent in size to one A level. There are four units of work that we study. Three are mandatory, which means that the exam board has said we need to deliver those three units. Um, two are externally ex assessed exams, which I will discuss in more detail. So the BTEC level three is over two years. And in the first year, in year 12, we concentrate on the theory aspects for your two externally assessed exams. So we start with unit two, which is the smaller of the two units, which is the fundamentals of computer systems. This is a written exam, which is one hour and 45 minutes long, and you will sit this in January 2021. So we start in September. We do the theory up till December. You will revise over the Christmas holidays. And when you come back, you will sit your exam within the first week. We then, after you finish that, we start on the unit one theory. Um, this is a bit more harder because it's more of the program in the principles of computer science. This is a written exam for two hours long and you will sit that in June 2021. It's out of 90 marks. The reason we do both of the exams is because luckily in the BTEC course, you are allowed to sit the exams for a maximum three times, which means if you don't quite get the grade that you want now, you can then resit them again in year 13. The reason we like to do your exams early as well is that it takes the pressure off and in the June of your year 13, which seems a long way away, you will be concentrating on exams for your other subjects. Um, we like to get yours out of the way so that we sort of know that you're on track for the qualification that you want to get at the end of it. So let's have a look at the unit two content. The idea of this unit is that you are looking at the principles of how computer systems work, how the different hardware and software work together and the way all of the components of the system work and how data in a system is used. It's very, very similar to the content that you have studied at GCSE, um, but we just go into a little bit more detail. So we look at the computer hardware, the software, how they work together in a computer system. We look at the way data is processed throughout that system. The approaches to the computer architecture. Now, you would have studied the von Neumann architecture already, but we do look at the Harvard as well, the different approaches. Um, we also look at cluster computing. The different concepts of these and how each register and register handling happens in each of the architectures. Again, I know you've studied this at GCSE, but we do look at it in a bit more detail. Number systems, we look at binary. In GCSE, you would have been able to convert binary to deanery and to hexadecimal and done simple addition. Uh, in the level three, we do also look at the multiplication and dividing of binary and how that is used. Text representation, we look at ASCII and Unicode and the different applications that those are used in. How images are represented in binary and the different data structures that are used, indices and matrices, how we transmit, transmit data across a network and between two different computer systems. We then look at different error detections and also how, once these errors have been detected, they can be corrected by a system automatically. We then look at the Boolean logic. Again, Boolean gates you would have looked at at GCSE but we add another two onto that. And flowcharts and system diagrams. You would have used this throughout your entire GCSE. There is nothing different about the flowcharts and system diagrams that we use at level three, apart from the problems that you need to solve are a lot harder. 
The Unit 1 content is also very, very similar to what you have already studied at GCSE. We look at computational thinking, algorithm design, pseudocode, flowcharts, how um, data is handled within a program that you write, the operations that you use, some of the built in functions like random and others that you would have already used at GCSE. How we validate the data that's used, different control structures that we look at, data structures, common algorithms that are used, which are your sorting and searching algorithms. Procedural programming, object orientated programming and event driven programming. <clears throat> so you can see from this that your unit one is really your programming aspect of the course. We do try to, and it's really important, the um, bridging work, which I will talk about in a minute, is completed in preparation for this. I can't teach you programming from scratch, so I really need to see that you have some understanding, whether it's just Python on its own, whether you've looked at other programs, um, but really take this time to have a look around at the many, many hundreds of programs that are out there and which ones are used for which application. The concepts of programming are exactly the same. The only thing that changes is the syntax and how it's used. Um, but we do look at that in much more detail within this unit. We will look at, um, I'm hoping, depending on the class that I have, not only to be using Python. I want to stretch you. I want you to use Visual Basic and probably some other programs out there as well. So it's really good to use this time to have a look around and see what's there. OK, so year 12, you've done both of your exams. By the time we start year 13, you will know the results of both of those exams. Whether you'll be pleased or not um, will depend on how well you study. But it does mean that you're going into year 13 knowing half of your grades already. You then have a decision to make whether you are going to resit the exams or you don't need to. Hopefully you won't need to. But in year 13, we then do our two units of coursework. These are task based assignments. The reason um, that we do this is that you have hands on experience in. Most um, employees out in the industry always moan that they have fantastic A level students that come to do um, apprenticeships. But they have no hands on experience. Um, from somebody that's been in the industry, it's, it's why I do the BTEC, because it's very important that you have experience to talk about. And it really is a fantastic way to learn something. It's fine um, understanding how a network works on paper, but can you actually build one? Well, you will do by the end of this unit. So unit seven is looking at IT systems and encryption and unit 14, um, we do the computer games development. So the unit seven, this is IT system security and encryption. This is the first one of your courseworks. And the introduction to this unit is that as a society, we are increasingly reliant on computer systems, which make us vulnerable to a range of attacks from cyber criminals. On a global scale, some conflicts reveal that IT systems are now a target. And as IT system security defences become more robust, attack methods become more sophisticated. And it has got into this cat and mouse um, ongoing um, scenario that the more uh, the security is upped, the better cyber criminals become. And they always want to get around any security that has been put in place. So these are the things that we look at. So we look at the threat types that are available, not only cyber criminals, but the internal threats to a business, the external threats, the physical threats, the malicious damage that could occur, as well as the software driven threats that we're aware of. And we look at those in more detail. We look at the passive wiretapping, active and the cloud computing security risks that are out there. We then look at the principles of confidentiality, integrity and availability of information. This means to make sure that our data and our information that company has is secure and it's only available to those people that have access to it and not those that want to do um, bad things with. We then look at the legal requirements that we have to adhere to within a business. 
So we will look at the Data Protection Act, the Computer Misuse Act, which you've already covered at GCSE, um, the telecommunications, the fraud legislation and any legal liability. Because remember, if you are not keeping that secure, you can be taken to court for that information being leaked. And then we look at those sort of impacts. So what impact happens to an organisation if they lose this data? What financial impact will it have on a business? What damage to reputation will it will it cause? Um, most big companies now that have had data breaches don't publish it. They don't want to damage the reputation that they've got. Because after all, would you want to keep your data with somebody who can't keep it secure? Of course you wouldn't. You then look at the legal consequences of data privacy breaches. So if we do breach, if a company does breach your security, um, you, as I said, you can be taken to court for it. And we also look at different forensic research, research to identify what has been lost, whether it's been stolen, whether it's been copied and how these firms um, are able to detect that. We then move on to making sure that we have the principles and uses of encryption. Um, the legal and ethical issues around that and the computational hardness assumption. We then also investigate the different methods that are used from the shift ciphers that we used, first of all, within encryption back in the in the war um, to different um, encryption algorithms that are used nowadays. We then look at the different applications of these and when is the best time to use them. And they range from um, early key encryption to um, how virtual private networks use cryptography within their security. All of those aspects will be um, discussed and used and then you will write a um, first assignment for these. It is a report based project. Um, you're looking at 10, 10 to 30 pages of um, A4 page where you are completing a report discussing all of these, the impacts that it has on a business um, and how to stay safe, basically. You then move on to the next part where you are examining the techniques that are used to protect an IT system from security threats. So we will look at the physical security. How do we keep our data secure within a physical building? Um, how do we keep that building safe, for example? Um, and looking at an IT disaster recovery plan if, if the worst case happens. We then look at the different policies and procedures you would need to put in place within your business. And then we look at the software based protection. So we're looking at antivirus software, for example, firewalls, um, user authentication, access controls, etc. And all three of those you will then discuss and come up with a plan of how you're going to use them within your business. And this is the application aspect of the coursework because you will then look about implementing those strategies. So we are very lucky enough to have a server room that will be yours and you will be responsible for um, creating, taking all of that information and creating your own network within that facility. You will be trying to implement all of the strategies that you've discussed to protect that IT system. If something doesn't work, then there is no problem because it's your system. Nobody else will be using it. You will test the system. You will make sure that that system is very secure. Um, and then I will come along and try to hack into it. Um, I warn you now, I'm quite good at those sorts of things. Um, but you will have hopefully implemented all of those strategies to make sure making sure it is all secure. Once you've finished that coursework, we then move on to the unit 14, which is the computer games development. It's probably one of the most um, fun units for me to teach uh, you to do. Um, the reason we do this unit is you have a practical game that you've created yourself and it's your idea. Nobody else tells you how to do it. Um, 
you've created it, it's yours and you can do with it what you want. Um, one of my students did put it on Steam just to have a look to see what, what um, feedback he got from the industry, really. Um, and it is something that's available to you. So within this unit, um, we investigate the computer games industry. And as you know, that has grown year on year. It's become a multi-billion pound industry. Um, and the different devices that have changed since I was a child and I first started gaming, um, I would never have believed would be possible now. So this is something that's really close to my heart. Um, I've probably been gaming since the age of 11 and I'm getting on now. Um, and it's quite exciting to see the changes. So we will look at things like the social trends. How have the trends in computer gaming changed over the years? What's the difference when I was 11 to what you do now? OK, and that has changed dramatically. There are different genres. There was probably only two uh, when I was 11. There are now hundreds. There are different players. Um, the game production has changed immensely. You have different technology coming out all the time. Um, and all of those things we will investigate. We then look at the technologies used in computer gaming, how um, when I was a child, you would buy a console with a cartridge and you would plug the cartridge in and then you'd play the games. That's all changed now. And again, it's adapting all the time. Um, mobile phones and different devices have changed that dramatically. So we will look at the hardware, what the impact is, the software that's been used, um, the different game engines that are used throughout. And we will investigate and play quite a lot of games. Um, that section will be your uh, theory side, I suppose. Um, you will again write a report based on all of those things and you are probably looking about 20 pages with this one. Um, the computer games design proce processes and techniques, we then investigate um, how these different techniques are used and all the different things that you need to think about. So you might think it's a really easy um, process that happens when you design a game, but there is much more to it. And we will look at all the different techniques and processes used, the mathematical, the graphical, um, different platforms, how you're going to deliver your game, the visual styles that you could use, the assets you would need and how your gameplay features would work. For example, are you going to use an avatar? Is it single player? Um, will you have a story or a narrative? alongside it? How are you going to make sure that the player achieves what you want them to do in the game? What are the challenges? What are the rewards? What are the difficulties? All of these different things you will think about for your computer game that you are going to produce. You then need to um, decide and design a lot of documentation. So you will be doing a brief. You will have a clear purpose, your client requirements all the legal and ethical considerations that you need to take into account. Your game design, um, your algorithm design, your pseudo code, your storyboard, your flow charts, all of those things you will be creating. And you might even create a full motion video as an entry to your game. Depends on how far you take it. But there are no limits with this. It's all about your imagination and how you are going to develop it. Um, you will then look at reviewing and refining your design. So you will work with a client and you will get others to improve their feedback to you and how you use that feedback to improve and refine your designs. A bit like with a new game that comes out, they get testers to play it for hours. Um, what a job to be a tester on a game. It sounds amazing. It probably isn't as much fun as we think it is sitting playing games all day long. Um, but you will hold meetings with your client, you will communicate with them and you will refine the ideas, as I said. You will then take all of these designs and develop your computer game. Now, this does take hours and hours and hours of learning new software and getting your head around what you want to do and how you're going to do it. It's very, very rewarding at the end when you have that computer game. So we will look at developing it you will look at um, testing your computer game. You will look at reviewing it, the quality of it, and has it 
done everything that you said it would do. And then you would do a uh, evaluation on your skills, your knowledge, your behaviours and how you've worked throughout this project. And you would review your game. OK. Um, as I said, it's a really, really worthwhile unit. Um, I love teaching it. I love to see the different ideas that you all have um, and seeing that that initial idea come into a real working game. And I will have examples of that for you to see when you start. The entry requirements. Um, now, on the uh, form, we say that you must have studied GCSE computer science and achieve at least a level six. You need to have at least a level six in GCSE maths because the maths content is quite hard. However, if you haven't met these requirements, do not write it off. Um, you can still show me that you have this passion that I'm looking for. In computing, it's not about um, the qualifications. It's about the passion. It's about what have you done? What have you shown me that you have this passion for computer science? You need to convince me over the summer holidays how much you want it. If it's something that you're really passionate about doing and you didn't get those grades, then we will have a conversation about it. So don't think it's all over. The bridging work is really important to show me that. OK, all of these things that I've asked you to look at are things that we will be looking at in more detail. And they are probably the things that you might not have studied at the GCSE. OK, but you do need to make sure it's 100% originally yours. Do not copy and paste it. There is no point. You are wasting my time and you, more importantly, you are wasting your time. So for this, I want to see a PowerPoint with all of your sources of information, um, about 15 to 20 slides discussing each one of these. Your task two was to carry out research on one person. This is just seeing where your passion lies. So the field of IT computing is huge and you can pick somebody I've never even heard of. But what I want you to do is do a bit of research. Have a look about what makes them special. Please don't do it on Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Alan Turing, Ada Lovelace. I know everything there is to know about these people. I've seen the films. I've done my own research. I would love you to find me somebody that I've not heard of. Why were they important? How did they change the field of IT computing? What did they do? What stood out about them? How have you? What research have you done on this person? You might have read a book. Um, you might have watched a film on them. There's lots and lots of different people that have had an impact on our field. Task three, this is where I want to see your programming. So what I've asked you to do for this is to make sure that you've done your Python um, and complete the Python course. For those of you that have done that at uh, GCSE, it's easy. It should take not long at all. Um, do not leave it till the last minute. Try and do them over a week. Try and do a few tasks each week to build it up. I don't want to see it all finished at the, the end. And then what I've asked you to do is also have a look at the HTML, CSS and JavaScript course on Code Academy. Um, it's something that we probably won't have time to cover in depth in lessons, but it is something that you need to be aware of, especially for the web aspects. Um, take a print screen of all completed courses and let me see. What would be really, really lovely to see is that you've taken what you've learned from these and you've started to develop your own codes. Push yourself, uh, think of something different and have a go. Task four, this is again, read a book or an article, watch a film, watch a YouTube video, go to a website, join an online course, um, online lectures. There's so much around at the moment, you're really lucky that because of lockdown, everything seems to be free. Um, I've probably done about nine courses myself. Uh, so it's really a good time to further develop yourself. All I want to know is which task you completed. What were your thoughts about it? Uh, what did it make you think? Did it inspire you in any way? 
just to leave you with a little uh, computational thinking task. Um, 30 seconds to add all numbers, 1 to 200, in your head. Go. Have you got the answer? How many of you got the answer? How many of you thought it was so hard you didn't even try and go, oh, 30 seconds to do that? I'm not going to be able to achieve that. How did you approach it if you did try? What did you think about? OK, I'm going to give you the answer because it's really simple and it's a brilliant technique to do to anybody. Um, little party trick. Breaking it up into a smaller puzzle. What is 200 plus one? What is 199 plus two? What is 198 plus three? Can you see where I'm going with this? Do you see a pattern? How many of these pairs will you have between one and 200? What is the last pair you'll find? 100 plus 101, what does it equal? Oh, it still comes up to 201. That means we have how many pairs? So if we have 100 pairs of sums of 201, how do we find the answer? What is 100 times 201? Now, what if you wanted to find the trick to do this with other numbers? How would you go about it? How easy could you do 2000, for example? And as I said, once you've got the hang of this, you could go on to 20,000. What stays the same? What is different? Have a look at the patterns. And it's a really good trick to do, party trick to do, that will wow people that you tell it to. Because you can ask them and go, well, I know the answer to that. It's blah. Um, they will look at you differently. If we use abstractions, we make our end goal something that can change. Say we name it blank, then we can make an algorithm that will work for any number. Blank divided by two times blank plus one. Test it. Test it on different numbers. See if it works. Using the tools of computational thinking is an extremely powerful skill for the rest of your life. Break it down, decompose it to its smallest factor. Look at the patterns, look at the similarities and the differences. Reduce the factor to its simplest form and then have a list of steps to follow to resolve a problem. As I said, an extremely powerful skill for the rest of your life. It's a great party trick and it will wow people. If you have any further questions, you can contact me on kissf at holmer.org.uk and I will be happy to answer any questions. I really hope you've enjoyed this little brief insight into BTEC Computing, and I really look forward to welcoming you to HGSS in September. Take care and enjoy your summer.